The right thing to do is narrated through the legend. The values of the legends have been the moral stories, the lessons to be learned. Our past has really been told by stories, word of mouth, and really also by legends. And I like to share the legend of the insatiable child called Uap. One of our local mermaids had a boy and she named it Uap. And Uap had this insatiable appetite. Pretty soon it was the, the whole family and the whole village that had to satisfy his hunger. Whatever crops they could produce on the island, most of it had to be dedicated to Uap. The animal husbandry that they raised, they had to feed Uap. And also the resources of the sea, they had to feed Uap. And he became such a giant that the village said, there's no way we can sustain our future if we're going to invest in this one hungry child. So in the end, he took a whole village to eliminate the child. So every night, almost every night, I walk to the sanctuary with my little lamp, especially if there's no moon, because during the time there are rocks on the way. When I get there, I have a little mat that I can sleep on. In the beach, which is open, when I'm lying on the mat and facing in the sky, I, I, I'm really, really happy when there's moon that glow the surrounding and including the sea, that I can see anyone that will come inside the, the sanctuary. And I can see also if there's no moon, the stars, which is beautiful, the falling stars and twinkling stars, it's really nice. I asked the star one night, I asked the star to glow more, like the moon, so it gives more bright light that can help me look on the sanctuary. This is what I imagine when I'm lying in the beach during the sanctuary at night, until I fall down to sleep. When I was 12 years old, that was the time my mother already dies during the time. She used to be the chief of the village and she started the marine sanctuary. I was appointed to be a warden on this place. The idea of sanctuary is to protect our nature, wildlife and animals that's supposed to be there. During that time, there was only few people Few creatures, birds, turtles, there was only few because the previous generation destroyed them. What I see before was the reef is depleting, the fish is getting smaller in numbers, and the population is increasing, but the fish population is dropping. When I see any wildlife, I really feel that they are my friend because I have only a few friends there.
During the time, I just imagined that I just draw friends as much as I can. So I have uh, somebody that can I talk and also somebody that can help me watch, which is only few people anyway. But I wanted them to join what is on my mind to keep the sanctuary. I'm not thinking outside marine sanctuary yet during the time. Well, most of the time we talk about fishing. <laughs> That is like our activity in the island. Almost all children or young ones there, like my age, we are fishermen. Second to that is we talk about the importance of keeping the sea because we are taught how to keep the fish there. So that's why when I grow up a little bit, I keep my friend. The birds and the turtles, including the surrounding nature, the stars, we are like friends together. Since I was a kid, I respect Mario so much because he was famous not only here in Apple. A respectful man. You could think sometimes, can I do it the same as Mario? He represents a model for young generations. I'm talking about a protector, not just here in the island, but also somewhere in the Philippines. Apple Island started the movement for conservation in the Philippines in terms of establishing marine protected areas with the legislation, with the framework on how to do it. And everyone's looking up to Apple Island because that's what marine protected areas could be. George Trupis. I live in Coroni. Beautiful place from what I see from all the world because my born here. From baby I started fishing because my father lived from this, from fishing. Must help him for living. And I live near to the harbor and always I go to the boat. Have the cold, have rain, have bad weather, big wave, everything. But I start to love it, this, to take my arms, all this. I like it, this, I feel this. Okay, sometimes I jealous because another boy going to the school and don't lost one day from school, and I lost because I go to fishing. And I go to Athens and drown the world. Because I learned too fast the job, I go bosun in the deck for the big cargo ship, and I love the sea <laughs> and the fishing. <laughs> and I think only I must catch the fish. I must have a fish, good fish I must have. I sleep a little, I eat a little, I drink too much water, <laughs> and if I have 300 hooks, after I make another. Before, more easy, because you have a lot of fish. But now, if you like to make this job, must forget the time to sleep. You sleep only one hour, two. My heart look, my hair, <laughs> my fingers feel nothing. My foot, too hard. It's a difficult time. for the difficult time coming. But how much difficult, how much present, I don't know, but the difficult time coming for people. Because planet need help and cry every day. The sea cry, the land cry, the air, it's cry. 
Everybody cry, nobody listen, nobody looking. I think sometimes, okay, I am no important guy. I am one fisherman. But I feel everything. I see the sea cry, but I can do something. Less fish every year in too much people. I hope one day do something. No future anymore. The fish less every day, people every year more poor. All fishermen feel this. In Athens, in Piraeus, in the island, and Europe also. Maybe I am stop because I am small one. The big one, it's okay. The small one, take the head. <laughs> Antarctica is a place that I don't think you can describe accurately without coming down to it. Antarctica is unique as a marine ecosystem because of the amount of productivity that you have. The sea ice that expands and retreats every year covers an area twice the size of the United States. What we're likely to have down here is an area that's got a lot of glaciers, a lot of mountains, a lot of very dynamic topography. You get a lot of nutrients and train in the upper part of the water column. And when you add nutrients and sunlight, you get an amazing amount of productivity. So in the summertime, when there's lots of sunlight, you get a lot of plant growth that feeds the smaller zooplankton that then get fed on by the birds, the seals, and the whales. And so as an ecosystem, there's probably more biomass here than anywhere else on the planet. So right now, we're almost across the Drake Passage. We left Ushuaia, Argentina about two days ago, and we're heading south-southeast. Yesterday, the swell in the Drake Passage was probably about 15 to 18 feet, about five or six meters. The winds were about 20 to 25 knots. My name's Ari Friedlander, and my main focus in research is the foraging ecology of marine mammals. We're about to get onto the continental shelf just off the South Shetland Islands, and we should be in calm waters and around the Antarctic Peninsula later tonight, early tomorrow morning. I'm always excited to come down, knowing that we're gonna be in a place that's unique, that has tons of whales right now, and is just the most spectacular and unique wilderness on the planet. grew up on the coast in New England. And one of the things in New England that you recognize is that the Yankee whaling industry was a huge part of why all of those cities exist there. And it was a huge reason why people were able to survive there. And so I grew up with the knowledge that whales were really important for people in some way, but in a commercial way. The history of the Antarctic is not good. Humans have been coming down for about 100, 120 years. Started with exploration and very quickly moved into whaling. There weren't factory ships. So when the catches were taken, they had to find a bay or a sheltered area for them to, to flens them out in. And actually a lot of the islands that we go to, like this one, Deception Island, was a place where they would kill whales, drag them into, and then work the carcasses up and then leave them here. In the 20th century, over two million whales were killed in the Southern Ocean as part of the commercial whaling industry. In the area where we're gonna be going, fin whales, blue whales, right whales, say whales, humpback whales were all killed in tens of thousands. In the Southern Ocean, 360,000 blue whales were killed. Over 725,000 fin whales were killed. Over 200,000 humpback whales. So what we see today is a very scarred ecosystem. There's been a big open wound that hasn't really healed very well. In 
my mind, one of the places that's the most critical for protection is the Antarctic Peninsula. The weather there is uh, much warmer now than it was 50 years ago. The number of days that are covered by sea ice is decreasing. It's also changing really quickly. It's a region that is heavily utilized by baleen whales, by penguins, by seabirds, and by seals. And it's a critical area for krill populations. And if we have an opportunity to sort of stop things before they get going in terms of heavy exploitation, we have that responsibility. Today, in June 2017, only 3.5% of the ocean is under protection, compared to 15% of the land. The United Nations has a target of 10% of the ocean protected by 2020, but still, this is not enough. Scientific studies recommend that we should protect a third of the ocean, 30%, by 2030. And some people are suggesting that we even should think of half of the ocean protected by 2050. California Redwood State Park, consisting of some 10,000 acres, mostly redwood forest, two and one half hours distant from San Francisco in Santa Cruz County, was the first California State Park to be established, saved forever from the acts to fill those who behold them with awe and reverence. The idea of protecting areas is not, not new. In 1870, California established Yosemite as a state park up in the Sierra. It wasn't the first national park, but it was probably the first major protected area set aside by the United States. It took us a lot longer to decide to protect our ocean resources. The first national parks were in the United States, and Yellowstone was the first. And then the next world park was, in fact, raw national, as far as I can see. So we started very early in Australia, about the turn of the last century when we started with national parks. And that process took a long time to grow, really. It wasn't quick, but the marine side really didn't do well at all. There was a big push to have the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park started. It was an emotional pull that the greatest world barrier reef had on Australians. It took a long time to set up good marine parks, and perhaps the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park might have been the kickoff to it all. This action will create the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands Marine National Monument, the largest single conservation area in the history of our country and the largest protected marine area in the world. The Palau National Marine Sanctuary is our contribution to the global effort to restore our oceans. It's time for the world to turn a corner on the protection of our oceans and Australia today leads that next step with the most comprehensive network of marine parks in the world. Now there is competition among country leaders to create marine reserves. It's so great to see leaders coming to conference and saying, I'm announcing this reserve which is bigger than yours. Just last month, we created the largest marine protected area on Earth. It is now twice the size of Texas. There's plenty of reason for hope. 
in the face of what seems to be a lot of despair. We know that there are actions that we can take. And the new binding treaty for high seas biodiversity can, to borrow a phrase, be the next giant leap for humankind. It may make it possible to create marine protected areas on the high seas and protect their resources for the shared benefit of all. I urge the people charged with negotiating this treaty, many of whom are no doubt in this room today, to be bold, to give this treaty teeth and vision and make it a game-changing Paris Agreement for the ocean. Politically, south of 60 degrees is what's considered the Southern Ocean. That entire area is governed by the Antarctic Treaty, which affords it certain levels of protection already. It's countries that have come together and signed a particular agreement to say, below this latitude, all of this land and all of this ocean is to be preserved peacefully and for science. So every country that has signed on to that agreement has kept the Antarctic as pristine as possible, and that our footprints are the only things that we leave when we come and visit. Commercial whaling was outlawed and banned in the 1980s, but there is a commercial krill fishery. The most recent marine protected area that was established in the Ross Sea came into being to try and mitigate some of the increases in fishing activity that are occurring in that part of the Antarctic in areas that are critical to the life history of other krill predators like penguins and whales. Generating a marine protected area is not easy at all. Honestly, the easy part is probably finding out where that area is. The hard part is then getting people to come together to agree on a set of rules. It can't just be one or two countries that say, okay, this needs to be done. It has to be uh, shared by as many countries as possible, and especially in the case of Antarctica. Yes, it is a lot of work, and yes, it is a lot of negotiation and shuttle diplomacy. And I was very happy that Monaco played a small part in that. The impact that the MPA and the Ross Sea is going to have will be, will be felt down the line for sure. It shows what you can do, what people can do if you can come together and agree on things. There's a blueprint, there's a plan in place. People have done this before. You should be able to do this. human conventions. It's not a natural thing. It's not an asteroid about to hit the Earth or climate changing or things like that. It's just agreements among people, and those can be changed. We are still a small portion of humanity trying to fight for our own environment, which we are part of. We might think that battle is so uphill that it's impossible. I think we have to try. I think the moment is coming. And the more we go forward, eventually things will change. The point is when. A long time ago, in the 2nd of March of 1991, I uh, presented the idea of the Pelago Sanctuary in Monaco in the presence of Prince Rainier III, the father of Prince Albert II. It's not a very wise thing to do, but in the end it paid. In those years, Italian drift net fishing for swordfish was running amok here. There were hundreds of boats, tens of thousands of kilometers of net, and the animals were dying. We started thinking about the necessity of establishing a protected area here, which was you know, going well beyond the territorial waters of any of the countries that are bounding here, the Italy, Monaco Principality, and France. 
everybody said that's a very stupid idea. I mean, you cannot possibly establish a marine protected area outside of a national jurisdiction. If you are really convinced about something, I think you should go for the fight. When we talk about these things that worry us, we tend to give the bad news. But we should try not to indulge too much into saying only the things that go bad, because there are things that go well, and when we have a chance, we should certainly celebrate them. In late June of this year, I had the great chance of visiting the whales in the Pelago Sanctuary with Prince Albert II of Monaco. Well, we are here tens of miles off of, uh, off of the southern French coast and not, of course not far from Monaco. We are in a very rich area of the Pelago Sanctuary, which is an area that covers 87,500 square kilometers between France, Italy, and Monaco. And it's the first marine mammal sanctuary in the Mediterranean of its kind, and it was very difficult to set up. followed it through my father and through the different steps that led up to the final document, the establishing of this sanctuary. 20 some odd years later, we can really see the difference. Professor Notar Bartolo, who led this effort, convinced others to finally sign that agreement in Brussels in 1993 to establish this very special sanctuary for marine mammals here in the Mediterranean. So international waters, by definition, you know, there is no jurisdiction and no power of establishing anything. Now everybody's talking about that. There is uh, negotiations going on within the United Nations about doing this systematically in the high seas everywhere in the planet. But then it was not said, so it was a dream. You know, I said, what the heck? I mean, we need to protect this area. There is important stuff that is in high danger. I think it served as an example for others and in other parts of the world to, to try to do the same. I feel very proud of that and very overjoyed that the success of this sanctuary can be duplicated in other parts of the world because we absolutely need in a very desperate way to protect more areas, to have more marine protected areas and sanctuaries in the different seas and oceans of the world.
本は昔クジラを食べていたっていう話を聞きましたでそれは誰かっていうと私のお父さんとかお母さんの父親母親から聞いたんですよねで小学生の頃に給食という形でクジラのお肉をで最初それを聞いた時にすごいびっくりしたんですよね私にとってクジラは今は食べ物としてクジラを見てる人はほとんどいなくてきっとなんだろうな美しい海の生き物の、まあ、一人、まあ、地球の生物の一人一つとして見てるんじゃないかなと思います。A couple of years ago, some colleagues and I wrote a paper where we took all the available information about humpback whales in the southern hemisphere and tried to argue a case that these animals are at a level right now where they were before whaling in a lot of places, and that the conservation efforts of hundreds and thousands of people and all the resources that went into it had a positive effect. And we're now at the point where we have to have these victories in conservation to say what we did had a positive outcome. And humpback whales are a great example. People care about them quite a bit. People put a lot of time and energy into them. I'm comfortable with the politics involved in getting these areas established with the need to have strong laws and robust science, but I know you can lose in the political arena easily. Yeah, it's hard. I mean, to be honest, you're a scientist, but you're also a stakeholder. I mean, you can't, you can't be objective in this, and I wouldn't want to be. It's a place, I mean, California's a place I love. The Antarctic is a place I want to see protected, and you do science to try and push that agenda, yeah. but who initiates that and where do you go with it is not always obvious. One of the things I'm really excited about being able to spend some time with Mike is to hear his stories and his experiences of how you go about protecting an area once you understand the things that are in that ecosystem that need protection. When people work together from different areas and different regions that have done things to protect marine life, we can really only learn from each other and it's going to make every experience better. So I'm going to take Ari uh, up in the plane to fly him over the California coast and look at some of our protected areas that we established here to get a sense of how important it is to create a network that's scientifically viable. some of the most beautiful, healthy kelp forests on the California coast. The area really is the Blue Serengeti. It's just teeming with marine life. Monterey Bay is such a haven for so much life. People have said that those of us in the conservation community are, are much better at the I have a nightmare speech than the I have a dream speech. And we need to be get better at the I have a dream speech. So over a 10-year period, when I served on the State Fish and Game Commission here, we methodically went up and down the coast creating science-based marine protected areas, the biggest network in the nation. And I think it is very important as we move forward to be protecting our environment that we do the same thing and to make similar commitments to protecting our ocean. 
Former Governor Schwarzenegger was a big supporter of our efforts to protect California's ocean. He saw marine protection and the network of marine protected areas that we created as part of his environmental legacy. He asked me personally to help him make that happen. number of fishermen on sometimes adversarial grounds. The fishermen had been able to fish anywhere for so many years, they did not want to stop fishing. We would have public hearings and a lot of fishermen would come. I think that the anger was really fueled by fear of how it was going to affect uh, their ability to support their families, make their boat payments, and those were all legitimate fears. So my grandfather had this eight millimeter camera that he was really proud of and took everywhere with him. His favorite thing to take film of was the fish he was harvesting. My parents would go out every single day in a 12 foot skiff and they would just fish the morning hours and they would come in with six, 700 pounds of rockfish every single day. That was the norm. They were easily twice the size of what is being harvested right now. Both my grandparents had worked in the sardine factories for more than 35 years, and they saw the crash of the sardine fishery. So a lot of the foraging species that we get local would be the sardines and the anchovies and even the krill. So the whales feed on these fisheries. And not just the whales, but the pelicans, the sea lions, the otters. A lot of different creatures need these forage species in order to survive. We are pulling out the fish that the creatures in the ocean need to survive. Our marine protected areas are very critical, and I think that they need to be enlarged. So what really matters is what's the legal protection for the area? Are there areas that are actually set aside where you can't fish, you can't drill for oil, you can't do any extractive activities? That's the trick. Each area is different, but what I look for is who has jurisdiction over an area? Here, it was the state of California. Yeah. So we had to influence the state of California to take action. Yeah, well, you hope everyone wants the same thing, but that's, that's obviously not an easy thing. <laughs> where all you've got competing interests and it's it's hard enough to get this done where you've just got one government to deal with instead right. of uh, more than a half a dozen. Yeah, I guess the trade-off is you probably have fewer people and fewer different types of views opposing what you want to do. is a small country, but a huge island nation. They have over half a million square kilometers of water around their islands. They have done something very, very courageous. They decided to protect 80% of their waters. No other country has done that. For a fishing culture, this is a big, big step. Palau is a clear global leader in ocean conservation. First day we were here, we had the privilege of diving in one of the truly great scuba dives of the world, and that's the Blue Corner, where the coral reef meets the deep water of the pelagic zone. And with the water from the open ocean come open ocean animals. We met the president right here at the Palau Aquarium. The expectations of Palau are very high. President Romengasau has become an international leader in ocean conservation. We need more world leaders like him. We're doing something that our values tell us we need to do. Uh, we're doing something that science is tell us needs to be done. And we're doing something that our traditional ancestors have been doing over centuries to preserve Palau to where it is today.
We met this morning with Keobel Sakuma, who reports directly to President Romengasau. The president asked Keobel to manage the entire Palau National Marine Sanctuary, which is all of Palau's waters, right out to 200 nautical miles offshore. So KB, as he's known, has a tremendous challenge. Today, I met with Mike Sutton, and I was able to show him what we do here in Palau to combat illegal fishing. The vessels that we have now in port are from General Santos City in the Philippines, and usually the catch on the Philippine vessels include the yellowfin tuna and skipjack tuna. When we boarded the fishing vessels from the Philippines that were caught here in Palau, we met with the captain, Rufino, and I think we were able to get a good idea of the complexity of the issue of illegal fishing and the fact that it's not just black and white, it's not the bad guys and the good guys. Did your owners tell you that even you have fish in your holds and you go through Palau, if you cannot prove the fish is not from Palau, that's yes, illegal? Yeah. So no other way to go from Indonesia to Philippines have to go through Palau? Did your owners say you go through Palau to get to General Santos? Uh, he said to my employer, there's no other way. This in Indonesia, Philippines, General Santos, no other way because it's very expensive. So your owner wanted you to take the short yes. route and not go short all the way around no. the short way. Yes, sir, because yeah. very expensive. Very expensive, yes. yeah. So, so your owner wants to save money. Uh, okay, that's good to know. There are people out there that are very poor trying to make a living and will do things sometimes outside of the law and sometimes being pushed by the owners of the vessels to do these things. And it's a lot harder than just throwing everybody in jail and locking up the key. How long have you been in Palau? Seven. Seven months? Seven months. Yes. So when you go back to General Santos or your village, do you tell them don't go to Palau or it's not good to go to Palau because you're going to go to jail if you go fishing in Palau? You tell other people? Yeah, me. Just as anyone would lock their door on the way out of their house if they're leaving for the day, we need to secure our borders because at the end of the day, we're a small island country. Really, it's a matter of survival for us. As we've begun to crack down harder on illegal fishing, we've seen less and less sharks and shark parts on board. The minimum penalty for even the possession of a shark part on a fishing vessel is a minimum of $500,000 and up to $1 million per part. In the past, we've seen vessels with their holds just full of shark parts, but it's been quite a long time since we've seen catches like that. Even the Vietnamese vessels that have been targeting the sea cucumber, we've seen less and less of them in our waters. Since we've started burning the boats and putting a deterrence campaign online, having a big media event out of each burning, we have not seen a single Vietnamese vessel fishing illegally in our waters in 2016 and 2017. We're starting to see that the collective international opinion is starting to change and really adopt what the Pacific countries have known all along in that not only the Pacific Ocean, but all oceans are interconnected and what happens in one country is not necessarily isolated to that country. I really want to say paradise is without man. Sometimes I feel that way. Like if we are not there and let nature just take its course and let animals of, of all species just live and not being consumed by our insatiable greed, I think paradise happens. I think paradise is already there. The Homo sapiens is also part of ecology. It's part of the interconnectedness of nature and we need to be a good part of nature. Getting to paradise means legislation, policy, framework, management. I mean, these are technical terms, but it means protecting 
places, not by just the mere declaration that it's protected. You really have to work for it. You need science, you need campaigns, you need the media, you need the communities to really work together and get to paradise. In our presentations, when we lobby for marine protected areas, we use the data that's recently available that after 25 years of protection, the biomass of fish around Apo Island has increased. And this is exactly the proof that we show. When I get a little bit older and become the chairman of the marine sanctuary, I start to expand my protection a little bit around Apo Island, so it's getting bigger and bigger. This dream is not on my mind when we started the sanctuary. I'm just focusing first in sanctuary and slowly expanding and expanding around Apo and slowly expanding a little bit to more people and now we are expanding outside Apo. I think it just comes slowly on my mind to expand more, getting more bigger, maybe because I'm getting older, so my, my idea is getting broader and bigger. Now I'm teaching the children to be environmentally aware. And together with that, I think for me, it's more effective if I train them scuba diving because if you are a fisherman, your objective is just to fish. But if you're a diver, it will change a little bit your mind to keep the fish there in the water. It is my requirement that we include the girls to participate in the program because they might be the next leaders. After seven years working with the children, teaching with the children about how to look after our seas, and we trained them scuba diving as well, six of them will finish their dive master course. I'm very excited now that this afternoon we will hand them a certificate to prove that they finish all the requirements necessary in order for them to be at that level. excited because after today our main job will start to teach other people in other places. On the 25th we will go and seek her to start the beginning of the main goal of this program. You need to share why because if we protect only Apple that's useless. We need to protect the whole Philippines and we if possible the whole planet. Every day as we breathe on the air, especially I'm in the middle of the sea, which is I love very much because I've grown up in the sea. There's some magic sometimes that come on my head that comes when you get older. The, the dream also will become bigger and sometimes I say that uh, it's impossible dream, but I have a courage also to make my dream happen. Yeah. 